Chapter 5 Schoolboy Astronaut Natalie always had the TV on, claiming that the noise calmed her nerves. And occasionally, something on the air grabbed Bradley's attention. When the newsman talked about a flying saucer sighting and showed footage of a fuzzy gray object in the sky, Bradley bent forward, riveted to the tube, trying to make out the details. But it was shown only for a few seconds. It was then that a man in a military uniform came on, convincing viewers it was just a weather phenomenon. Bradley didn't believe him. The idea that a flying saucer could be visiting Earth from another planet seemed perfectly natural to him. What didn't make sense was why anybody would lie about it. He ran six blocks to the corner grocery store, where among the dozens of publications and newspapers, he found a Look magazine with a picture on the cover of an orange disc flying over the treetops. It was called a UFO, or an unidentified flying object. The flying saucer had a red trail behind it, which gave the impression of super speed. He frantically looked inside the magazine for more flying saucer pictures. Hey, are you going to buy that? Said a man at the cash register, frowning and pointing his big accusatory finger at Bradley. Sorry, I don't have any money. I just want to look. Bradley curled his toes into the ground and pointed his sneakers inward. You have to buy it to look at it. Which was bull, thought Bradley. The man probably just didn't like kids in his store. Bradley put the magazine back on the rack and headed home with his head down and hands in his pockets, frustrated by not having any money and wondering how in the world to get some. Mom, do you know anything about flying saucers? Bradley asked when he made it home. Natalie was sitting at a small sewing machine, patching his torn pants. Oh, honey, it's probably just someone's imagination. Anybody who says something crazy can get on the news. <laughs> if there really are flying saucers, where do you think they come from anyway? <laughs> she laughed like it was a joke, which made Bradley's stomach tighten into a knot. They come from outer space. I want to go to outer space and meet them. I don't know about that. You sure don't, thought Bradley. He couldn't explain why he believed there was intelligent life on other planets. It just seemed natural and made sense. One evening, astronauts were interviewed on NBC. John Glenn, the first American to orbit the Earth, was there, and seeing him caused a strange reaction inside of Bradley, a feeling that this man was someone he wanted to be like. He had never seen a man like that before. Then John Glenn said something that set Bradley on fire. Uh, you kids need to do your best in school. If you make good grades, you can do anything you want, even become an astronaut, he said with a wink. Bradley's heart beat fast. Was this true? If he worked hard enough, could he also become an astronaut? John Glenn became Bradley's hero. He even wondered what his life would be like if the astronaut was his father. He ran to Natalie. Mom, how can I make A's in school? Ah, oh, honey, why do you care about that? She said, folding clothes on an ironing board. He liked it when she was doing housework. It had a way of making him feel safe and that the craziness would stop. Jeffrey was playing with some wooden blocks on the floor. The astronauts had to make good grades in school and I want to be an astronaut. He blurted out, expecting a scolding, feeling the skin on his back get prickly. Really? Why don't you want a normal job? What do you want to go into space for? She looked at him with one eyebrow raised. You know about the flying saucers? They must be coming from space... Because we don't make anything like that. If we can go into space, we can find out where they're coming from. Oh, is that what you think? She reached for her ever-present pack of camels and lit one with a match, blowing a cloud of smoke over his head. Anticipating the stinky fumes, he shuffled sideways. The questions were coming rapid fire, and she still hadn't told him how he could make good grades. His parents had bad things to say about people who were successful. The man is out to get you. The man and his badasses, as Mo put it. Bradley wondered if his need to make A's would make them think he was trying to become the man. They probably thought the astronauts were part of the conspiracy too. But he couldn't see John Glenn that way. I don't know what to tell you, Bradley. If you want to make A's in school, be my guest. But honey, I love you no matter what grades you make. You know that, don't you? She came over, bent down, gave him a sweet hug, and put a kiss on his forehead. The rare display of affection made him stiffen. The cigarette fumes hit him, and he held his breath until she let him go. Yeah, Mom, he replied. Bradley came up with a plan. 
he was going to tell his teacher, Mrs. Finchbow, that she had to give him good grades so he could become an astronaut. She was pretty, with dark curly hair and a sparkling smile, and the kids would watch her wave her arms and move around while she talked to the class. She also kept to a strict routine, taking roll call and standing for the Pledge of Allegiance every morning. Bradley came to like the orderly routine of school, which was unlike anything at home where there were surprises or upsets every day. Recess came and the kids jumped out of their seats as usual. Don't run, Mrs. Finchbow said. Thinking about how he was going to ask for help made him sick to his stomach. He needed to get his mind off it. So he asked some kids if they wanted to race to the fence and back. Billy, who was a kid from another class, agreed. Oh, yeah. Nobody beats me. Okay, dude, let's go. Billy was taller than Bradley, had long legs, and started flashing a toothy grin like he had already won. They got a few kids to watch, and someone made a starting line. Then they faced the fence, which was about half a football field away. Okay, go, said another kid swinging his arm like he was flagging a car at a racetrack. Bradley lunged forward and pushed off. He felt light from his nervous energy and pumped his legs like crazy. They reached the fence in no time. But instead of tagging it and spinning around to run back, he bounced into the metal chain links, catapulted himself in the opposite direction, and raced hard to the finish line. His ribs hurt where he had smashed the fence, but it didn't slow him down. He strained and pumped with Billy so close he could hear him breathing. Go, go! Bradley willed himself with all his heart, barely beating Billy to the finish line. Wow! Bradley is the winner! Whoa! You cheated! You cheated by using the fence! I want to do it again! Billy said, catching his breath and whining. The kids talked about it, concluding there was no rule about bouncing off the fence, so Bradley was the hero of the day. His ribs hurt for a week, and purple bruises appeared on the side of his chest, but it was worth it. He loved winning. It was a couple of weeks before the Christmas break, and the classroom coat closet was full of children's raincoats. Next to a big mat to dry your feet on, there were colorful umbrellas and a few pair of galoshes as restless third graders tried to stay quiet on a rainy day in Pasadena. Mrs. Finchbow's heels clicked on the wooden floor as she went up one row and down the other, returning homework assignments. With a flick of her wrist, she dropped Bradley's on his desk. Her swishy dress almost touched him as she passed, leaving a flowery scent in her wake. There was a red C- in the upper left corner. At least it wasn't an F. Another F and Mom would hurt him. At least she cared that much. Mrs. Finchbow stopped next to Scott next and looked right at him. Her eyes shined over her broad smile. Good work, Scott, she said, laying the paper carefully on his desk like it was a treasure. Bradley leaned to one side and craned his neck to see A plus excellent in big red letters across the top of the page. Bradley looked at his teacher, his arms suddenly starting to itch. To keep from scratching until they bled, he grabbed the edges of his wooden seat and squeezed hard. I want that. I want to make an A. Scott was grinning with his nose in the air, and Bradley involuntarily clenched his teeth until his jaw ached. You punk. You're just a punk. Mrs. Finchbow stopped again in the next row and said, Fine work, Lori. She must have made an eight, too. Ugh. Bradley let go of his seat and picked up his paper, which had accusatory red marks on every page, as well as a note. Bradley, did you read the assignment first? Maybe he didn't read it. He usually just jumped ahead to the questions. Up until now, he'd liked third grade. It was easy, and people were nice as long as he behaved and didn't talk much. But the way his teacher had smiled at Scott right after she dropped Bradley's homework without breaking stride, like she was depositing trash, changed all that. Bradley felt something deep inside of him, something that he couldn't put into words, like a hunger that needed to be satisfied. It made him want to break something. After school, he chucked rocks at the walls in an alley, throwing until his arm hurt. The pain made it so he could no longer throw straight, and a rock went over the wall and broke a window. He ran home, thinking, I am bad. I'm the one that's broken. For days, Bradley brooded over his C-minus. He dreamed about Mrs. Finchbaugh smiling at him, handing his homework back with a big red A on it. He wondered what would happen if he went to ask her for help. Maybe she would laugh or scold him, say he was too stupid to make an A, or just tell him not to worry about it. Finally, he forced himself to approach her after school. If she doesn't help me, I'll go to the principal's office. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to write a letter to the President of the United States. Bradley stood shyly before his teacher's desk. 
a fire burning inside of him. How can I make A's? He choked on the words. I need to make A's. He punched the words out louder. Mrs. Finchbauer appeared to be touched. Bradley, I am so glad that you are asking. She took his hand in hers. It was soft and moist and sat him down before beginning to instruct him on reading habits, how to take notes and studying every day. Never miss a day to learn something, Bradley. Even a short time helps. Knowledge is a gift that will make your life better and the lives of those around you. She knew of the domestic violence reports and his father's criminal history. After Bradley had missed one school day too many, the principal summoned his parents, who promised that Bradley would improve and that his brother Jeffrey, who was about to start first grade, would not be such a problem. It was good for everyone that only Natalie could hear her husband when he muttered, Who does this son of a bitch think he is? She had fought hard not to giggle. Bradley made his first A the following week and showed it to his mother, who appeared to be proud of him. After a few more A's, he stopped showing her because she no longer cared. One day, after a particularly bad fight between his parents the night before, Mrs. Finchbow called him out in front of the whole class. Bradley, don't fall asleep on me, please. Her voice was muffled and distant as he opened his eyes to see his classmates all looking at him. Someone giggled, and he felt his face flush. He started scratching his arms, his nails digging into the flesh. During the fight, Bradley had crawled under his bed and stayed there for hours. Jeffrey was crying. At least the cops hadn't come. Another day, Mrs. Finchbaugh walked by his desk and didn't stop. On top of the paper, there was a B. Ugh. It felt like someone kicked him in the belly. He held his breath and clenched his teeth to keep from yelling. Shut up, you stupid punk. He swore at himself quietly for the rest of the day. When class let out, he went and stood in front of her desk. Yes, Bradley? She asked. Why did I make a B, Mrs. Finchbow? His voice sounded whiny. Toughen up, kid. Don't be a sissy. I was wondering the same thing. You made several errors. Is everything all right at home? I don't know. Telling her there was trouble would make it worse, especially if Dad found out. He was back at the house drinking booze, once again without a job, and had picked fights with Mom two nights in a row. Bradley never revealed the details to anyone, but Mrs. Finchbauer didn't need the details. She understood what I don't know meant. Why don't you stay in the library for two hours after school every day and do all your work before you go home, she said. I know your mother won't like it, but I'll write a note explaining that you're working on special assignments. Okay, he said. But I don't need a note. She won't care. Imagining making a B again scared him to death. If he couldn't make A's, there was nothing to live for. The thing that had been awakened deep inside of him had to be satisfied. He had no idea where it was coming from, but it would not let him go. It was late spring and the end of the school year was approaching. Bradley stared hard at his desk, sitting on his hands to keep from scratching. The assignment had been a lot of work. They had to name the capital cities and describe the customs of people in 10 countries. Bradley did 15 instead. He wrote and rewrote several pages, double-checking his work, agonizing over the rules. He had been staying in the library just like she said, where he would work until he got too hungry to concentrate or too tired to stay awake. Mrs. Finchbow went up and down the roads, returning assignments. Bradley's heart was racing. If I don't get an A, I'm going to go crazy. When she arrived at his desk and stopped, his heart skipped. He pulled his hands out from under him, looking up at the brunette curls bouncing on her shoulders. She smiled at him with her shiny lips and soft eyes. Excellent work, Bradley. Very, very good. She laid the paper down gently onto his desk. It had a big red A plus inside a red circle. The same red as her lips. I'm going to be an astronaut. I'm going to be an astronaut, Bradley whispered to himself. He felt like he could drift out of his chair and float into outer space. He ran home after class to show the A-plus to mom. He even hoped dad was there. Imagine how proud he would be. He had a job these days, but with irregular hours as a welder. He came home with dirty clothes, complaining that his back was aching. Shortly after, he would start drinking. Bradley burst through the door and found his father parked in front of the TV. Bradley handed him the papers, watching as his father scanned them. 
Then, without a word, he stood up and paced into the kitchen. Mo cracked open another can of beer and slid into a slump at the dining table. Bradley waited on the couch, hoping for some kind words, but he felt he should keep his distance while Mo shuffled through the papers. Look at this kid. He thinks he's going to be all smart and show us up, huh, Mama? Ah, oh, Morris, stop it. He's a good boy. I see him with his nose in a book all the time, though. I think he wants to be an astronaut. What? What in Christ's sake is that all about? An astronaut? Don't you want to be a welder like your father or your grandfather? His father's voice carried an angry edge. Bradley stood up from the couch and said, I don't know, Dad. I just want to make good grades. But he did know. He knew he didn't want to come home with welding burns on his arms or back pain and the need to get drunk. Mo heaved himself out of the little chair, which squealed on the cracked linoleum, and sauntered across the room to Natalie, grabbing her wrist and rubbing her bottom. Come on, baby. Let's go to bed. I need a back rub. Mo slammed the bedroom door closed. Bradley got a book and went into the bathroom where he tried to read and ignore the oohs and ahs that came from the squeaking bed for the next hour.